and I'm really thrilled to see all of you. Um, I'm really thrilled. Um, I'm eager to share this book, uh, this in heartbeat with you, and also to commemorate the 80th anniversary of the beginning of the Spanish Civil War. Um, and here with us tonight is the executive director of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archive, the organization in this country that keeps um, that history alive. Her name is Marina Gard, and she's brought some material um, from ALBA, and you can meet her later in the back. I, I often think about ALBA as being a little bit like the Anne Frank House um, in Amsterdam, uh, because you think that it's just going to be about Anne Frank, which would be enough in the Holocaust, but in fact, it's about uh, justice um, all over the world and now even more than then. And ALBA is not only involved with uh, preserving the history of the Spanish Civil War and the American bets in it, but in preserving the, the ideas that drove those men and women uh, to Spain. It's a really fantastic uh, organization. Anyhow, I'm sure most of you know something about the Spanish Civil War, but I thought I should say a few things anyway. Um, it is one of the great uh, events of the 20th century, both real and symbolic, where Spanish Republicans and 40,000 international volunteers, 40,000 from 36 countries and counting, um, fought Francisco uh, Franco between 1936 and 1939, but also, and perhaps even more importantly, Mussolini and Hitler, who supplied the Spanish fascists while Americans Brits and the French stood neutral, leaving the Soviet Union to fill in the gap. 2,800 of those 40,000 were Americans, uh, representing, and this really surprised me, these Americans represented 70 European nationalities. I didn't think there were 70. <laughs> but when I, when I asked the expert, he told me, yes, and that includes Welsh and Slovenes. Um, there were uh, 300 of, the, of uh, those people who went to Spain had Spanish surnames, so that's interesting to think about, too. Um, and 90 were African Americans, and they were perfectly integrated uh, into uh, the international uh, brigades. It was the first time there was such an integrated um, uh, armed force uh, anywhere, and it well, you can only imagine what it meant, both to the blacks and to the whites. Um, and there were 75 women, um, varying in ages, uh, some married, mostly not, but some with children. Um, they came from every state in the United States, except Delaware and Wyoming. Every state in the Union. Um, most were communists, some were socialists, others were liberals. A third of them were Jewish. Um, the, the fighting uh, was fierce on both the left and the right, as was typical of Europe in those awful years of the 30s, but, you know, they're eerily suggestive of what we're now going through in the States. I don't know how many people have been struck by Trump on the one hand, but Bernie on the other hand, you know, and it's an extraordinary time, which is both scary and very exhilarating. And that was the case in the 30s in Europe as well. Um, it was an international struggle that plucked at the hearts, um, plucked at the hearts and idealism and passions of people, it broke many a heart. Albert Camus wrote, Spain under Franco remained a bad wound in the heart, even a reminder that one can be right and yet be vanquished, that force can subdue the spirit, that there are times when courage does not have its reward. It is this, no doubt, which explains why so many people all over the world feel the Spanish drama as a personal tragedy. Now, of course, the question that plagues most people, and certainly did me as I want, went to find out more about my uncle Dave Lipton, is why? Why did they go? Why did they go when most didn't go? And of course, I had to also ask myself, would I? If it were possible, is that something that I would have done? Um, and the question was answered in, answered in an interesting way. One of the Hollywood Ten 
Uh, Alva Bessie said, you can, yes, he said, you can think of love, the love you have never had and could not give, and you are afraid that you will die without that love. You're not just afraid to die, and this is one of the people who went to Spain. And this is the meaning of it all, the people's war. They could not accept their death with such good grace if they did not love so deeply and so well. What other reason could there be for dying? What other reason for this blood upon your hands? Um, and then another man, a poet, Edwin Rolfe, also one of the uh, vets, said this, just what it was that sent each single one of these Americans across the Atlantic to fight for the independence of Spain will never be completely known. The bridge between the impulse and the act is a highly personal process. There is a no man's land between conviction and action into which the great majority of humankind never venture. I think that's really profound. Um, so that's the bigger picture, and the, um, the smaller picture is my family. Uh, the mystery, uh, the riddle that really was at the heart of my family. So I want to just give you a sense of how this young man was seen in the family. And I'm talking about somebody who's 22 years old. Um, and I don't know why this is of particular importance, but he, he was a virgin also. I, mean, I learned this from people who knew him and knew about some events in Paris. And, um, so even though communism, you know, the, the young communist league that he was a part of encouraged uh, you know, free love, obviously this wasn't something that for whatever reason got to my uncle. <laughs> Well, he was very cute, though, you can see. <laughs> um, anyhow, whenever Dave's name was mentioned, Uncle Phil shifted in his seat. Dad's face hardened, Mom's eyes filled with tears. Phil said, of the three of us brothers, Dave is the only one that mattered. His life, his death, the rest of us are nobodies. Dave died for something. He was something. Louis, my father, three years younger than Phil, jittery and distracted, interrupted. Listen, I couldn't find anything wrong with him. That's why I loved him, because there was nobody like that. He was, a very, he was very sweet. I loved him dearly. But then he added, ah, he died for nothing. Two very different positions in the family, right? Anyway, um, uh, the next scene is a uh, supper. It, it's over the holiday of Passover, but because the family is uh, communist, they don't do any of the rituals, the Jewish rituals. They just get together and <laughs> insult each other. It's basically, yeah, <laughs> sort of what happens. <laughs> and eat, and you know, with soup and noodle pudding or whatever. You can't eat noodles. Kugel, kugel. Okay, I, I didn't learn a lot of this. I mean, I know. Okay. So at at at, <laughs> at the table, this this is what happens. So how's business, Louis? somebody asks. You gonna make a go of this one, inquires Rose in her gravelly voice. Come over sometime, I'll show you, Rosie, he answers, winking and chewing at the same time. That's my pop talking. You can't go down to Miami at the drop of a hat anymore, chasing, she stops in mid-sentence as she notices my mother. <laughs> sure I can, my father says, nothing stops me, I'm, my, I'm my own boss. Yeah, some boss, says Robert, Rose's husband. I hear your partner's not too happy. You'll ruin the luncheonette like you do everything. Oh, is that right, Mr. Successful Food Peddler? <laughs> that, that's what I mean, you know. Um, what has my partner been saying, my brilliant Schnorra partner? <laughs> Never mind. What do I care what he says? He's got no balls, that Italian wife of his pushing him around. Just then, my brother looks up from his plate, where he's been organizing his food into discreet piles and says, where's Uncle Dave? The words slap the Passover table shut. Mouths clench, eyelids drop. At the sink, Grandma's body stiffens and she leans forward on her elbows. My father looks nervously towards his mother. What a tragedy, Yadasha murmurs. My mother sags in her seat. He was the nicest man I ever knew, she says. My father glares at my brother. Can't you sit up straight? He yells. And what are you staring at, Trudy? He snaps at my mother. Nothing, Louis, nothing, she murmurs. He threw his life away, Louis whispers. 
What good was it? He's yelling now. What use was it? Somebody want to answer me? A young boy's life destroyed? What good? Are you crazy, Louis? demands Yadasha, her voice rising too. If Roosevelt had done what those men and women did and the Soviet Union did, and if America hadn't waited till 1941, we might never have had a war. We might have destroyed Hitler at the start. Oh yeah, Yadasha? That's Louis. If you're such a true believer, you send your own sons next time. Louis, don't excite yourself, my mother interjects, nervously stretching her hand out for him. She shoves it away. Send your own goddamn sons, my father hollers again. Grandma straightens up then, smooths her apron, and looks at my father. Zain Shah, quiet, she warns him. Gnug, enough. So there you have the sense of the conflict, the sense of the intensity, the rage. Um, and then there is an artifact. Uh, a shoebox. Uh, and this is a shoebox that I saw off and on uh, over my growing up that was in uh, my father's closet. And every once in a while, he would bring it down. And, um, and he never opened it in my presence. He just looked at it. He sort of held it and looked at it. And it, it always struck me that he was like a davening Jew, you know, sort of like, and and he, there was nothing davening about my father. There was nothing religious about my father. But there was something about that shoebox and the way he held it that also, frankly, reminds me of uh, a Christian saint. I mean, it was like my father's... Somehow his relationship to that box was emblematic in the way that paintings of saints uh, in Christian art uh, are. Um, so he said... He would say occasionally, someday I'll tell you about my brother. And over the years, things sort of spill out, uh, not as he's holding the box, but because I start looking, and my brother had also done some looking already. And the things that were, were, were in the box were letters in Yiddish, um, playbills for the theater, for um, uh, Hellman, Hellman play, I remember tickets to the theater, bus schedules to the Catskills, and a harmonica. So here's a piece of the first letter that the boy wrote home. Um, I should say that uh, he had lied to his parents and told them he was going to the Catskills to work as a waiter. So they didn't know he was in Spain. Um, but then there's a reversal. Um, and it's not clear exactly why this happens, but he then, when he's in Spain, decides to uh, tell his parents. My dear parents, I'm sitting on a mountain among vineyards and olive trees covered with the blood of Spain. I'm looking at the sunset and I weep and weep and weep. I am crying with hot tears that are pouring out of my eyes, and I don't want to stop that flow of tears because I think of you, my dear parents, the thought of the pain and anguish I cause you and the thought that you think of me while you are reading this letter. I cried because I could not kiss you before I left, because I could not tell you where I was going and not explain why I was going, and I could not tell you what Spain means to you and to the whole world. Forgive me, understand me, and please don't be angry. He also says near the end of the letter, write and write often and send packages and he outlines things that could be sent like cigarettes and chocolate and canned food. And uh, at least once he says, Mama, don't cry. Um, this mo mama, by the way, had already lost four of her, three of her uh, children, her boy children. She had six sons, right? Three of them died, two, uh, three of them died in the, the childhood in Europe. And then when I entered the picture, uh, this youngest son uh, was dead. So she was four of her six children. Um, um, so the shoebox, the elusive letters, the intensity, the emotional chaos, the secret, secrecy, the odd politics, you know, people saying he, he died for something important, my father saying he died for nothing. Um, all of this left profound traces uh, in 
the family and in, in the next generation. Um, interestingly, the personalities of these two men were very different, different and unpredictably so. My father was sort of the macho strutter, <clears throat> um, the tumbler, the boxer, uh, the womanizer, the dancer, you know, fun, a lot of fun there. Um, but a lot of posing, too. And Dave, by comparison from everybody I met and spoke to when I met, I was lucky to meet a lot of people, um, he was shy, uh, he was uh, quiet, he was stubborn, he was committed, he, he was very, uh, women liked him a lot in a way that uh, often reminds me of how straight women enjoy gay men, not to project too much here, but uh, nobody was ever attracted to him. He never had a girlfriend that anybody told us about. But, but the women loved his company. That, that included uh, my mother. Um, one of the leaders uh, at the YCL, the Young Communist League, he was involved with this guy, Schrank, said, he said to me, Dave wasn't uh, an adventurer. He was a contemplative person. He evoked in you a feeling of, what can we do for you? Come on, Dave, what can we do for you? Young people who joined our organization, wrote Schrank, came for the social life, but Dave was brooding and thinking all the time. At parties, he'd always be sitting quietly, talking in a corner. The guys would kid him about girls and made him blush. So this guy was like the marshmallow in my father's mind. My father was the guy. And his brother was this kind of sweet, committed, sweetie pie. Um, and how did it happen that that's the one who went to Spain? I mean, who? I mean, one of the interesting questions for me, and maybe we'll talk about it later, is that the question of what is a man? You know, in their in their minds, and maybe in ours too now, especially after. I think, anyhow, a program like Transparent, which was just, uh, I don't know if you've seen this amazing series about a trans parent and the rest of the Meshuggah family. Um, anyway, um, he may not have been a committed person in love yet in his life, but he surely was a man that was uh, committed uh, to doing what he thought of as the right thing. You know, so in, in New York, he, uh, organized, he organized strikers. He helped people who had been thrown out of their apartment uh, with all their furniture and helped bring it back in because there was a law that if you got the furniture back in within a certain amount of time, the landlord would have to wait another six months to throw them out. Um, yeah, and they knew all about this. And he worked in the unemployment bureaus and uh, organizing the weren't bureaus then. Um, uh, and he, he went to Spain. How he took the decision, we don't really know. I mean, people, he said he talked about it, he thought about it for a long time. My own hunch is that um, after thinking and talking about it for a long time, uh, I just have this feeling it could have happened like this. He runs into somebody and says, hi, Dave. The guy says, hi, Dave, what are you doing? You're like going to City College? And Dave looked at him and he said, no, I'm going to Spain. Like, I can imagine with all of the thinking and feeling ineffectual in the awful 30s that he would have thought, what am I doing here? Why am I staying here? You know, and that's what drove a lot of people then uh, to go to Spain. Um, anyway, I spent a lot of time looking for people, looking for his friends in the Bronx and Brooklyn. Um, had letters from girls in the Catskills. Um, one, anyway, uh, and I, um, because I did a lot of research in the, in the archive, which at that point was up at Brandeis, um, so I'm looking for people who knew him, and, um, I came across this guy, Bill Wheeler. He was listed on the memorial for Dave, um, and that was held after he died, after he was killed. Um, and uh, he was, uh, Bill Wheeler was one of the speakers. So when I went to one of the, this archive, and I was 
trying to act like I knew something. I went to the librarian. I showed him the, uh, you know, the, the flyer, uh, you know, three names on it. And the guy, you know, points to the all three names and he says, dead, dead, dead. All right, well, you know, I, I'm a historian. I, I don't expect people to be alive. <laughs> just, to, just tell me how I can find out about them, you know. Um, so, uh, I then go to the vet's office, which is now the Alvo office, um, Veterans of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, uh, and I run into this wonderful, very small guy, his name is Abe Small Gordon, who, because he was small, was one of the great runners in Spain. He only had one eye, most of his life he only had one eye, um, and I, you know, uh, I take out I take out the flyer again, you know, uh, and I say, dead, dead, dead. <laughs> and he says, no, Wheeler is not dead. So I find there's this guy who knew, not who knew, I didn't know that he knew him. I then wrote letters to a bunch of people, uh, and uh, Bill, Bill wrote me back. And he said, um, I do remember your uncle, Dave Lipton, and now, thanks to you, he has a name that time and a flagging memory have erased. Dave's death, more than any of the too many others I have witnessed, has haunted me to this day. Dave and I first met aboard the ship that was carrying several volunteers and seven of us who had been sent home and were returning for the second time. And then he describes the scene of um, a sort of a moment of quiet in the battle, and he says, we were at rest in the evening before crossing the Ebro, and Dave handed me a letter written in Yiddish asking me to mail it to his brother if anything should happen to him. I remember telling him, you'll be okay, just keep your head and fanny down. The next morning, he asked for the letter back and tore it to bits. Of course, the rest of the story is that a little later on, uh, a couple of days later, a Bill asks Dave to go down and get grenades someplace, and Dave gets them and comes back, and as he's walking towards him, and Bill is about to tell him to go, Dave gets uh, shot and killed by a sniper. And um, Bill says, uh, tell when I meet him, which I do, he, he says, he just stood there yelling, no, no, no. Um, you can only imagine the thinking of uh, his mother, right? I assume he was thinking of his mother. Um, anyhow, I have an urge to call my father to tell him my, there's a witness. I mean, my father, you know, my father says, uh, uh, I, I tell him uh, I'm, I'm all excited, and, he, and he's silent. And he, he says, why do you care what, about all this? He asks quietly. I don't know, Dad. Uh, it's interesting. But then... Why do I care? Because my uncle was brave? Because his decision enthralls me? The journey intrigues me? The optimism amazes me? I don't know. Do I suspect that there's another narrative even more enticing than the story I've been given? And that this hidden tale is discoverable? That I can uncover it, dust it off, stand it up, and march it into plain uh, view? Um, well, yeah, that's what I want. I wanted to discover the story that seemed to be hidden um, and where I wasn't getting, I was never getting any straight uh, answers. Um, my father did a lot of uh, fancy stepping around letters, the letters that were in the box and where the letters should be mailed to. Um, and he even re re reached the, what I, pictures of hysteria uh, when talking about it. Now I have to say that there were moments where I pushed him very hard and I haven't even included those passages in this book. They were so over the top. And I, I seemed so mean, you know, because I, I just knew there was a story there that he wasn't, uh, he wasn't telling me. Um, anyhow, but then knowing my father, uh, he probably got angry apropos of what he might have done to prevent contact with Dave. Um, forget about it, he might have counseled himself. It's no big deal. What was going to Spain about anyway? 
What was so important that this Pisher, this baby brother of his, was doing? He, Louie, was the man, wasn't he? The boxer, the gambler, the tough guy. Dave was just a quiet, good boy. How did he end up being the one who went to Spain anyway? It's all Narishkeit, nonsense. My father would come back to himself a big shot, the Lifshitz big shot. That was, that was the name before it was changed to Lifton. Nobody would know anything. Letters, schmetters, it would all just go away. But Dave would have seen it differently, I think. And at the memorial for him that was organized, that I mentioned to you, um, Dave is, uh, I see Dave sitting in the last row, rocking back on his chair. He might have shaken his head sadly, nodding, poor Louie, always messing things up. I know he loved me, and now he's lost me, and he's lost the chance to move away from the family, make his own life, and he'll never write, which was an ambition of my father. That's over now. Sure, there'll be moments when he makes a for foray onto the dance floor, a gleam back in his eye, and he'll charge full steam ahead into what might have been. I wouldn't change places with him for anything. Thank you. I think that's one thing. 
The other thing was, I think my father was very invested with his image of himself as the man, as I suggested. Um, and so, as I sort of alluded to, what's the man? What's a man? I mean, is it is a guy? Is a man? You know, the the seducer. Um, uh, you know, the uh, the boxer, which he was also. Um, could, what, but what about this kid, you know, who, uh, you know, was committed to this political life in New York? All right, that doesn't look very macho. And in fact, by the way, one of the things I noticed meeting uh, a lot of these people late in their life, that's true, was that they were very sweet guys, a lot of them. Um, uh, so, you know, how do you assess this uh this, this character uh, in him. I mean, I think, frankly, this is talk, and I'm gonna, I'll, I think I'll play my father here and be narcissistic, that um, I think that one of the reasons this attracted me so much is that it raised these questions about masculinity and therefore femininity, um, and that the spectrum was much greater uh, than uh, it was suggested to me uh, to be, even as a child. I think that, you know, how children know everything about their parents. And I think I knew underneath my father's bravura that he was a kind of delicate soul himself. Mm -hmm. And I think so another aspect of, his, of this is that he envied Dave. Um, so uh, he envied him, he admired him, he felt he betrayed him. Um, I think he was utterly confused by the way that Dave broke the narrative of the nuclear family and the conventional family. Um, now, you know, I may be reading too much into this, so, but I don't think possible to do that, but um, <laughs> uh, I don't know, is that an answer? Well, he fatally, I mean, your, your dad fatally undermined your, um, your uncle's relationship with parents, so well, he may have been, again, just from, the, from an outside observer's point of view, he may have been jealous, envious in some ways, there may have been a macho sort of questioning around why this brother got so much devotion from people. Um, but that's still a very, very fundamental act of um, sabotage. I know, um, but you know, I think that saying that it fatally undermined it is uh, is not. I don't. It's not quite right um, because look, those parents didn't stop loving the boy because this happened. Um, you know, sure. you you know, right? That doesn't happen. So, what element of control then? Do you your father was seeking to assert by preventing the passage of those letters to their rightful recipients? Um, well, you know, some people say in, those, in that situation that he was protecting them. You know, I don't really buy that, but that, it, this wasn't, he wasn't, this wasn't the only instance of the letters not being handed over at a certain point. Um, I think he was doing something very manipulative, no question about it. Um, I think he was a very, I, I'm not willing uh, to give it all a, a, a conscious uh, drive. I, I, can't, I, don't, I can't, I mustn't, we mustn't do that. I, I really think he got caught up in the emotion of all of it and his own narcissism and his own tumbling and his own running around New York trying to make a buck, trying to keep up in a marriage he really didn't want to be in. Um, and uh, going to the movies, you know, and having the egg cream, and picking up James, and, and you know, oh, my brother, I was in Spain, and I have these letters, and, and my parents, you know, if I go in and give them the letters, uh, they're going to be mad at me, you know, and he just kept saying to himself, uh, look, he'll be back, you know, it'll be fine. But I think you have an answer that you would like to you would <laughs> like to express. Well, well, go ahead. <laughs> Since you are. Uh, no, I, I haven't actually, but I would like to ask. I, I, you know, did you ask your? I guess the, the natural question is: Did you ask when you found out the truth and the scale of what happened? Did you ask your dad why he'd done? What, in his words, what how did he explain that? I guess. Yeah, that was that's what I cut out of the book in a <laughs> way. I mean, because it was quite. Uh, it was a very tumultuous, you can imagine, exchange. I went down to Miami to see him with his second wife. Yeah. 
Um, and, uh, you know, she says, to, I say to my father, let's go downstairs, you know, into the rec room that they have in this huge apartment building in Miami, you know. Um, and he sort of doesn't want to go, and the wife says, go with your daughter, go with your daughter, you know. So he goes downstairs with me, uh, and I start asking him again about Dave, and he says, I, I don't want to talk about this, you know. Uh, you know, and I, now I have, at this point, had, had loads of information. You know, I had loads of letters, and I had Bill, you know, had been, not only had been with Dave when he was murdered, murdered uh, but had been on the boat with Dave. They had spent time on the ship. They spent a, a, night, a night in Paris together. And when I watched, frankly, um, I don't know how many of you saw the book trailer uh, that we put online, I noticed watching Bill talk in that trailer that something strange happens when he um, when he says that Dave walks towards him and he didn't have time to tell him to bend down, that he, he fidgets with his collar in a way that makes me think there's, a, there's more story there than, um, than he's relating. And I felt that even when I visited him and uh, so on. Um, so, I mean, okay, so I kept, I kept pushing it, and, uh, and I just finally said, Dad, why didn't you give the letters to your parents? And uh, he got very angry. I mean, he was, and his anger was scary. Um, uh, you know, I get up, he got up, he walked, you know, it was a direct room, big room, but it was empty except for us. And they went, oh, and this, he was already in his 80s when he's acting like this, you know, but it doesn't matter. He's hurling himself around the room, yelling, and he sits down again. And I says, look, you know, this was a long time ago. Just tell me what happened. Um, and then he broke down. And uh, he broke down and he said, look, uh, I meant to do it. I meant to do it. I carried them around with me. Um, they, kept, they were on me all the time. In fact, I'm thinking about publishing this, this other ending someplace mm -hmm. because it's, it's so, it's very fleshed out. Um, uh, and, then, and then he said, um, and then it was too late. Then I got the letter that said he was dead. So when you said I meant to, I meant to, he means I meant to hand it over, I meant to. And I believe him. Yeah. I, I believe him. And in fact, you know, it took me so many years to write this book. I mean, luckily there are other books in between, but I think it took me so many years to write this book because I was so angry at him. Mm. Um, and you know, when he broke down that day, I really believed him. I, he didn't mean to do it. Because there are lots of villains in the world, you don't want to know their backstory because you don't want to forgive them. You know, I won't, I won't mention names. You know. <laughs> um, they gauge. You know. uh, uh, um, Was it satisfactory enough of an answer for you for breaking down of what he did say? Was that enough for you? Because the book was researching and doing the book, you have been updating further histories for you or any other unanswered questions around this slice of family history. Um, it was satis satisfactory. Um, no, in fact, I, I don't have more questions. I feel very satisfied with what I have come to understand about my own ambivalence around politics. I mean, I'm of a generation where I had friends who were active in the civil rights movement and who were active in the anti-war movement. I was not. Um, and I, when I tried to go with a friend on an anti-war march, I had to leave. I, I was very upset by the crowds. Um, and I, it was only with the women's movement that I really found a politics where I could be effective and useful. And, uh, but I know, now I understand, that my father, um, I am thinking it's yeah, true. Yeah. Um, uh, that my father's push pull on Dave, you know, the loving him, the attachment, I felt the love, uh, but also nothing is worth dying for. Um, look, you, look what you do to your family when you do something like this. Um, you know, I, I couldn't handle it. Um, 
So that was very helpful to me. Yeah, when we were discussing this evening, you said one of the issues for you, you're a feminist, and you're, in this book you're writing about these two very different men and the context of war. What was that like as an experience from the city of writing the book? That sounds like Well, I have asked myself this question. <laughs> I mean, all my work, uh, important work, and it has since my dissertation, has really been Marxist and feminist. Um, and why was I writing this book about men and war? Um, and actually, the, I, the book I have in my mind to do next is related to this in a way. Um, I think, uh, I really think what I said before is true, that there was something feminine in Dave and something feminine in my father, and that I always sensed in myself um, uh, a spectrum of male-female uh, that I liked. I mean, I even remember having this uh, conversation with a psychoanalyst many years. It wasn't a conversation. I was lying on the couch. And I, at that point in my, <laughs> so at that point in my life, it, it, when I was talking about my dreams, I uh, apparently said, I kept confusing he and she. Uh, and the analyst said, I think you have a problem with your pronoun, your, your gender, the you he and the she are confusing them. I, and this was like the, in, in the midst of the women's movement, it was like an exciting moment, and even lying down in that traditional situation, I said, you think this is a problem? I think this is an accomplishment. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I did, and I, yeah, I did. Uh, so, um, yeah. So, I, yeah, I think, I think that's it. I mean, also, psychologically speaking, yeah. personally speaking, uh, I think a lot of my own uh, stuff, uh, women and my mother, was camouflaged by things with my father. So um, that's another reason. But also, it's uh, it was inescapable. Yeah, it was absolutely inescapable. There he was, you know, uh, and he was so loved, mm -hmm. and yet so not reviled, but condescended to. Mm -hmm. uh, how could you think of having a dramatic, useful, powerful life, a political life? Um, and intellectual life if the people you loved both loved it and reviled it at the same time, mm -hmm. you know? It's like, it's like gender didn't matter. Something was, I never thought I'd feel that way, that like was somehow bigger than gender. Um, Did you ever, in the research, I'm going to come, I'm going to come and ask if anyone's got questions. Yeah, I, I, so I, have, I didn't bring my watch with me. Yeah, so. okay. um, but I did want to ask about Dave himself. Because he's, he's obviously a fascinating, charismatic figure, and you found him so when you were a very young girl. Now, you said when you were just talking in the introduction, you know, thought or known to be a virgin, yeah. gay question mark. Did you, researching the book, is there any notion, I mean, there are so many simplistic stories that one could map onto someone like Dave, a secretly gay man operating that side of his life outside the confines of family because he needed to it in that particular historical moment. Well, that's true. What do you think about Dave in that sense? Having looked at as much material as you have looked at as well, I don't know. I, I think that he um, he was unevolved in a certain way. I think that he was sexually unevolved, but he was obviously happy with men. Yeah. He was happy in the relationship with Bill. Maybe there was something more with Bill. I, I, I'm inclined to think there might have been um, knowing Bill. Also. Did you ask Bill or was it a bit no, too? Yeah, I couldn't. Yeah. Could it's conceivable, had I noticed what I did in the video recently, years ago, when he was still alive, that I might have. But, and he would be okay with that. It would have been okay with my asking, but it didn't occur to me. Or I didn't, I don't know, I couldn't be. Maybe I didn't admit it to myself at that point. Um, then, um, there was a point where I said to my father, well, what's this story with, you know, no girlfriend? And uh, maybe he was gay. My father said, no, no, I wasn't gay. And then he said, maybe he was. 
Thanks, Dad. Here's another rug. <laughs> My father was uh, Master rug a, a sad right. scholar, and I was a good male, but... Um, uh, and then there are these pictures I have that are on the cover of the, uh, yeah. the book. Um, and I tried to track that guy down. I really did. I had a letter, you know, with a, from a guy at, at, at Low Today from uh, Ann Arbor um, in Michigan at the university. Uh, but he had a very ordinary Jewish name. His name is David Hurwitz. And uh, I wrote to people, but the only thing that makes me think, I mean, this is, this is too simple. When I finally got close to finding, I thought somebody, and I laid out sort of a little what I was thinking, yeah. nobody answered me. So that made me uh, Now, then there's another thing, and this also is just, could really be happenstance. Yeah. But one of the men who talked at Dave's memorial with Bill, um, and this other fellow, this, this guy's name is David McKelvey White, he was gay. And uh, the communists gave him a very hard time, mm. and he ultimately committed suicide. Mm. So, you know, once I had this thought about Dave, and then I knew that McKelvey White had spoken, that you know, I, 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 I um, yeah. But you know, now after Transparent and living through everything that we've all lived through, I almost it doesn't matter. I mean, I, like I hope he had pleasure in his life. I was going to say he had some happiness with whatever he could yeah. define as that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Look, we're being asked to wind up, but I, I would like to take at least one question. Oh, yes. oh, we have to have more than one. Yes, sir. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I know. No, really. Would you, could you while you're there give, give me my watch? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, we're, we're going to do more than. That was Dave. <laughs> oh, oh, that's you, you were speculating on doing thought experiments about your father's uh, motives. When that first letter came, the very first one, forget all of them collectively, the first letter comes, it's, I assume, addressed to your father? No, the, the, the no. It, it's it, addressed it, to the, grand, the parents. So it comes to the house. It's Doesn't not. The house. Where does it come to? It's a very intricate story, and I really want you to look, read the book. <laughs> Let me ask this question: In that first letter, when your father gets the first letter, you were doing thought experiments. What do you think his motivation was for stopping right there in the beginning? Stopping. Well, he, it, the it, first it, thing my impulse would be, oh wow, uh, here's the letter. Gary, he didn't stop then because he had already given Dave instructions about where to mail those letters. This was part of a strategy. That's why uh, Tim is pushing this question because it was calculated. It seems more calculated than not. It was calculated. I know it's it's I know it's demon in a way it's demonic. But uh, I don't yeah yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> yes. When did your mother find out? Um, you mean about the letters and everything? Yeah. I don't think she knew. She never knew where uh, She was. knew that there were letters in a box. And when I found them, I think with my brother when we were children, uh, they were in a box in Hurleyville in the Catskills where my grandparents lived. Mm -hmm. And they were hidden in a drawer that was sort of locked. It's hard to open. So I don't know... They were in their house, but I don't know if they ever saw the letters. And then I know that the letters were taken from that house by my father, you see. So, you know, the pain was so great around the loss of this boy. And my mother really loved him, uh, too, really loved him. Um, I don't think they, I don't think she ever asked about but I think what Catherine, um, I don't yeah. want to take that out of your mouth, but I, I, I think what she might be asking is, did your mother ever live with all circumstances of her sons? It wasn't her, no, no, you're oh, talking about, they, no, no, uh, my mother was right. not. You're talking about his mother or my mother? His mother. His mother. Oh, his mother. So did she ever know the whole thing? No, I don't think so. I don't she think so. He died in the States? 
No, no, she knew he died in Spain because he, she got a letter. Yeah, she got a letter from the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, uh, the, the vets of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, and he was dead. Um, God, I mean, who knows what, what, from knowing nothing to getting that letter was like. And then there was another letter from the United States government uh, about it because she, she couldn't accept that he was dead in Spain. So she wrote to the government. Um, uh, she never talked to them. And I was very close to my grandparents. I not that you know with that generation that they would have talked about these things. Um, yes. Um, so was Dave the only member of your family who was a member of the Communist Party no. at the time? So it wasn't him being a communist that was upsetting at all to the family. Not at all. The communism came right out of my grandmother <laughs> and then her brothers uh, who were still in the Soviet Union. Um, no, no. Was your dad also a member? No, my mother was. Um, I remember as a little girl going with my, my mother, uh, handing out the daily work of <laughs> selling it. Really. Um, and I think, I don't, I mean, my mother, my mother was the one who kept Dave alive in the family. She's the one who went to the reunions every week, every year. Um, she's the one who carried something. And, and you know, I, I had a complicated relationship with my mother, but. I noticed that she kept doing it, getting dressed very nicely every spring, you know, to go to these uh, reunions. Um, uh, and I, I think that that moment in her life with Dave was important to her. Um, yeah, I, think, I know it was. I know. But she never knew about the letter. You know, she died too soon for me to go. And, I mean, it was just happened, actually, when I got to learn all of this. Um, she would have been interested because she, it was, my parents were divorced and she really, my mother couldn't let herself die until both my father and his wife were dead. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, was, she was so pissed at them that she would have rejoiced. I mean, she was out, of course Louis did that, you know. Yeah, I think this has to be the last question. In view of the communist leanings within your family, were their political feelings intense enough that it was reasonable to them for someone to take a major step, like go to Spain and fight in the brigade, as opposed to local Absolutely. rallies? Absolutely. But you don't want your kid to do it. Even if, you know, you don't want your kid to do it. Absolutely. And I think somewhere, I mean, my uncle went to a camp where he learned how to use guns. And I think my grandmother knew. Um, so she had to have some idea of what was going on, you know. It's a fascinating book, and yes, thank you so much for oh, coming.